Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Mirabal. I'm with Melco's application team. And let me make sure we're up on both platforms. It looks like we are. All right, so I see us on both Facebook and YouTube. So welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Samantha Mirabal, and this is our Design Shop Talk, um, where we answer any questions, try to do them on a weekly basis. Last week, I had to cancel on short notice. I was sick. It was a bad week. Um, anyway, so let's jump right into it. If you have questions while we're live, feel free to type them in on the comments. We're again live both on Facebook and YouTube. So just put them in. Don't send them privately. I don't see those while we're live. Um, so just type in what questions you have and we'll try to jump on those as well. All right, so let's see. Hey, Debbie on YouTube from New York. Welcome, thank you for joining. All right. So let's see, how do you arc text like a smile? Awesome. All right, so let's go to design shop and let's write some text. So I just clicked on stuff. Let's start. So the text tool is this one. You can also do control T. I'm just gonna use the icon so you can see my mousey. And to write text, you arc. Hey, good morning, Maxine. Thanks for joining from Oregon. So we've got everyone up north right now. I'm in Florida. We have a tropical storm coming. It'll be fun. <laughs> All right. So let's see. I've got some text here. Let's do that. So to get into the properties, you double click on it. And once it's here, you'll see down here we've got some options. One is the line type. That's where you can get your arc. All right. So this we've got our eyebrows here so how do we get it to be a smile that was the question so we want it to go the opposite way um so there's a few things before i'm just going to leave the property box up um so what we're going to do here is take this guy here and you'll see down here i can either rotate it twice by using the little rotate rotate icons right here um, or you can click the mirror whatever this one is, and then that one. So those two buttons, just click them each once, all right? And that will flip it upside down. Which, all right, so now we have a smile, but it's reading backwards, right? So how do we change that? Well, again, if you double click on it to bring up your property box, and under the lettering, right here, you'll see there's an angle, all right? So if I change this one, oh, not, not the angle, excuse me. So the angle is the other way to make it flip upside down. But you'll see right here, there's counterclockwise. So that will change the text direction so that it reads right side up rather than upside down. All right, so um, yeah. Now there's a question on YouTube that says, um, can this be done with hand-drawn text? So uh, yes, it's a little bit, it's an interesting question because if you digitize your text as um, a OFA file, so if what that means is, and we do have some link, um, some videos that have been done on this tool. So I'm not gonna go into it in a lot of detail, but you'll see there's this alphabet editor. So if you went and created your own font and each of these characters, every letter you digitized, so this is how the OFA files, the font files are created. So if you did that, then whatever font you did, you'll have these options for. All right. Now, if you're bringing in one letter at a time as a DST file, uh, yeah, you can still do this. It's just going to be you're going to have to rotate and position all the text um, appropriately. OK, so it's yes, but um, let's see. All right. Anyway, so that that gets our smile. And we do have a video that we're um, giving you the links to now on the alphabet editor. So if you wanna see how to digitize your own fonts, um, it's a lot of fun. So you can work on that. Uh, how do you turn a design into a patch? Okay, so let's go make one. All right, so I'm gonna go grab, I'm gonna use this insert file and I'm gonna to go to the C drive. You guys have all these designs too. And I'm gonna to go to designs and I'm just gonna grab my one day design for simplicity. But it, whatever design you have, okay? So you're gonna go find your shape. And then from there, 
Um, now you've got to, right, right now it's just something that's going to sew out, right? So to make it a patch, you've got to have your placement stitch for the fabric. You've got to have the zigzag that holds the fabric in place. And then you want either a satin stitch around the edge or the foam arrow. Um, so some sort of border, right? So how do we do that? Well, I can, let's do it this way first. So I'm going to go and use my walk input. I'm going to then choose this guy here, which is my automatic circle. And I'm going to hold my shift key down to lock it into a perfect circle. And I'm drawing a circle. All right. Is that where I want it? No, but that's okay. So I can move it around after I draw it and line it up however it is I want. Okay. Um, a trick you can always use is if I group my main design, all right, so if I select the thing that I'm trying to center, and then right here, you'll see there's this group icon, all right, so now that this whole thing is grouped together, and what did that do? That just means now that when I go and click any part of it, it's all going to select it once. So now, if I want to center that perfectly inside of the circle, now I can do that because I select everything. I'm gonna, actually, I'm gonna click on this guy and my circle. And then right here, you'll see I have this vertically center and I've got the horizontally center. And now that thing is perfectly centered, top to bottom, side to side. All right, so I've got a circle. That's cute. Uh, I want it first, right? So I'm going to select my circle and drag it to the top. I'm, all I'm doing is rearranging the order that it's going to sew in. So now I've got a circle. So now I'm just going to copy and paste it a lot and make some changes. All right. So I've got, that's my placement. I'm going to copy, control C, paste, control V. I'm going to give it another color. All right. Um, and I like to change this to a bean stitch. Does it have to be a bean stitch? No, I just like that. So I've got my placement, which shows me where the fabric goes. I'm going to lay my fabric down if I'm cutting it in the hoop. That's what I need this bean stitch for. Um, that's going to hold the fabric in place so then I can go grab my curvy scissors, which I don't have next to me today, but these will do. So I grab my scissors and cut out my shape. And then again, I'm going to copy and paste that guy again. Again, give it another color. And this time I want to change it to a zigzag. So what is a zigzag? That's a single line center. So I'm going to use this change element from one type to another button and I'm going to change it to a single line center and I want to replace it. So my bean stitch is now a single line, but I don't want the type to be satin. I want it to be a tackle because that's going to give me that cute little zigzag. It ta the, the tackle stitch is level dependent. If you don't have that, that's okay. Um, you can still make this work by using a satin stitch and then going into the properties and turning off auto density and making your um, density here somewhere between 17 to 20, somewhere in there, will give you kind of a faux zigzag stitch to hold that fabric down. Okay. All right. So I got my placement, my tack down, the zigzag, which holds all that fabric. Then I'm going to sew my design. All right. So I'm going to, again, copy this thing, my zigzag. And after my design, I'm going to paste it because the very last thing we want to do is do our satin stitch. So this time, I'm going to make it an actual satin stitch and I want it to be wider, let's say 45, eh, 40, whatever, something like that. And that will give me my satin stitch around. Okay, so that can be done with any shape. I did it with a circle, but the same principle goes where let's say I want to, I don't know, I want a house shaped patch. All right, an ugly house. <laughs> Oops, let's add another point and close this. There we go. So let's say that's the shape patch we want. Well, I can still do, use that shape and do the exact same thing. Copy, paste, give it another color, make it a bean stitch. Copy, paste. I can use the control key, but remember we did change element from one type to another, or I can use control and click on the single line. Now let's make that a different color. Change that to tackle with a width of something closer to 30. All right, and then copy paste. Oh, look at the mess I got down here front because I have my points all weird. So I'm gonna 
move that guy. There we go. That's better. All right. So this final one, now we're going to make that a satin stitch. And let's make its width closer to 40 and a different color. So like I said, it, any shape you want, you can turn into a patch. It doesn't have to be a circle. Um, it can be this. Now, if you want to use the faux marrow stitch, you can absolutely do that. So rather than using that single line, which I've been using, it would be a decorative. So it's going to be the walk. So I'm just going to replace that with a walk. And then up here, change it to a decorative. And then under here, you've got this these faux patch borders. And you just need to make sure that the chain stitch is on the right side of it because they have different ones. There's a faux one and two, and that just changes the direction. Okay, so that's really all you have to do. You'll see, um, I, if I use this, I'm gonna have to go and adjust my, um, twill, my tackle stitch by coming over here and doing, let's do a custom. I forget which direction. Nope, not that one. There we go. To make it further in. All right. So yeah, that'll get you. Can you show how to break it apart again? Machine blocked up. Break what apart? MK, buddy, if you can let me know what you want to break apart. The shape. So if I want to break this shape. Good morning, Lauren in Alaska. Uh, let's see. So if I want to... Oh, the corner. Yeah. So um, on this decorative, sometimes these corners are strange. And if you need to clean them up, what do you do? Well, I come to the point where I want to break it apart. And I select that point. And then if I hold this button down, you'll see there's split element at selected points. That'll split it. And you can do that to any of these. And from here, you'll notice now I've got that line separated. So I can drag this around and put it wherever I need it to go. All right, so let's say I wanted to move this way over here for some reason, I could. All right, now clearly I don't want to do that, but that's how you would um, work it. So you would just come and select whatever it is you want to adjust, split the element apart, and then you can drag these around, making them go wherever you want. Okay. All right. So patches are a lot of fun. You can, um, there's a lot you can do with them. So I even saw a really neat little effect where someone did a running stitch over the top of this. Um, to give it a really neat um, kind of texture to it. So there's just so many things you can do. And then to turn any design into a patch. It's pretty easy. All right, let's see. We did that. All right. Where can I find the inf information on digitizing a file for a hat rather than a flat? Um, we've got a bunch of articles and um, videos and whatnot on the YouTube. So we'll get you a link to the hat resources for you. Um, but I mean, hats, digitizing for hats versus flats isn't a ton different with it. I'm looking for my hat picture. Really, the only thing that's different is you have to think about you're sewing away from things that don't move. So you've got a plan to push things from bottom to top. And why is that? Because I'm trying to get away from this rim. And then I want to push away from this center seam because that seam's not going to move. So I want to sew center out. So when you're planning out your routes of how you're going to get um, through a design, that's really what you're thinking about is moving away from things that aren't going to move and finish as you go. So you're going to get much better results if you outline things as you go. So let's say you've got some lettering and each letter has a border around it. What you don't want to do is sew the entire text and then come back and do all the borders. Because what happens? Remember, embroidery is going to move, particularly on hats. Stuff starts to shift and push around. So if things are moving, what do you think is going to happen by the time it comes back for the border? Nothing's going to line up quite right unless you're lucky, right? So that's where it 
finish as you go becomes a really important thing to consider that you're outlining as you go along. Okay, and we, we have some links in the comments for you on hats, so check those out. All right, so let me go back to my questions. Um, where can I find the first video on how to create a freestanding patch? Um, if you go to the FAQ site, and we'll try to get you the link, there is an article on patches, and in there there's two PDFs, um, which is, I think, what you're referencing. So rather than doing what I showed you here, they actually digitize the whole thing un without the border on it. So it's just a running stitch and then the design, then it stops, they cut it out, and then it does this, the rest of it where it puts the pre-cut out shape down, the zigzag in the border as a second hooping. So um, there is an article on the FAQ site and we'll get you the link to that. Um, so that's where you'll find the details on that. There's a whole lot of ways. I know I've done several videos um, of where I've actually set up each of the steps and shown different ways to do them. Um, there's an applique video, which I actually did as a patch um, in there. So there's quite a few resources and we'll see if we can get you those links. All right. Uh, let's see. So this person's asking, hey, you know, I've, I'm sewing and I'm noticing I'm having some issues. Oh, what do I do about this gap? All right. Is that my issue? Well, yeah, gaps like this. I'll just say from my experience, they're not a good thing um, because what you end up getting is a lot of flagging. And what does flagging cause? That's the hoop bouncing. All right, so the hoop's gonna bounce. That's gonna rub on the thread. Next thing you know, you're gonna have thread breaks and all kinds of just nuisances to deal with, right? So um, Midwest Products, Mighty Hoops, a company that makes these things, the uh, Mighty Hoops here. So where the bracket attaches, there's these what they call spacers and they go between the bracket and the hoop what does that do it lowers the hoop all right so they make these little spacers um you can get them i believe straight from Mid midwest products i'm melco might have them on shop melco i honestly don't know so um whoever's on for me sorry if you can put in if you guys have them there that would be cool um, if not, I know you can get them straight from Mighty Hoops and they're little spacers. It lowers the hoop and that will deal, um, adjust it. They make also a bunch of different brackets. Um, some of the brackets have bends in them to help move the hoop down as well. So there's things like that. All right. Um, let's see. Can I go over how to put a stop after each color change for in the hoop project? So when I was doing that patch file, you'll notice, oh my goodness. Um, so we did get you a link to the spacers. All right, so, um, oh, I, I was putting color changes in and that was so that when I go to the machine, I could put program in those stops. So how do we do that? So I put both of the interfaces here so you could see them. I use the advanced interface personally in my shop. So I always tend to pull this one up and forget to show you guys this guy. But when you're going to color um, your, you know, set it up, you've got two different options. So you've got your applique or you have the pause or hold. Okay, so you've got those as well. I would suggest using applique or hold. So what those are going to do is the, the applique stop, so what you'll see here, it's got color one and applique. So what does that actually do? So how do you do that? You go choose what color. So in this case, it's needle one. Uh, color one is done on needle one. So they clicked that, then applique, and then it was color five, color five. All right, so this is a three color design with one stop. So what does that actually do? So the applique stop is going to, when the machine's gonna sew color one. When it gets to that word applique, the machine's gonna stop. The hoop is gonna pop out from under the needle case and it's gonna sit there and wait for you to do whatever it is you're gonna do, all right? So whether you need to lay some fabric down and hit go, whether you need to grab your scissors and trim in the hoop, um, you need to put a zipper down, whatever project you're working on, lay a piece of fabric on it, um, that's when you do it. When you're ready, grab you hit the green button, the hoop, which start, it, the hoop will slide back under, and then it will proceed on to the next color. If you need, mul every time you need a stop, you can hit applique. So I can actually have color applique, color applique, you know, just keep on program programming that in. And every time it gets to a stop, the word applique, it'll stop, the hoop will pop out, and it'll sit there. If you're working on a hat, um, I personally wouldn't say use applique, I would use um, the hold. 
hold is, it's just a stop command, right? So it just stops. And it sits there until you hit the green button to make it go again. All right, so if you go out to lay a piece of puff down, um, whatever you're doing. So those are the two ways you do it. I use applique on flats, hold on hats. All right, um, over here, you've got the applique button. So it works the same way. So you program your appliques by clicking on the applique button. All right, so that's how you set them up for in the hoop. Oh, let's see. Oops, where's my, there it is. Um, we did that, we talked about that. We did that one, all right. Um, I wanna learn how to make lace with Design Shop 11. Thank okay, so lace is interesting because freestanding lace is something that you're going to sew into something that dissolves away. And then when you wash away the stabilizer, you need it to hold together, right? So really the practice, the work on that is, it's more of an exercise of thinking through the project to make sure that you're connecting everything together before you go back over. So um, for instance, if I'm doing a grid pattern through there, right? I'm not just gonna do one line and one line I'm gonna go back over them in different directions to lock those threads together so that they can't come apart, right? So it's, you wanna make sure you're planning through it, you're doing kind of almost more underlay than you would want manually, and then coming back over with your satin stitches or whatever it is. Um, there's really no magic sauce to it short of working through it, thinking about it, making sure your underlays and everything tie together that you don't have things just hanging out in space because if they're hanging out in space, they got nothing to hold them together when you rinse it out, right? So it's really a puzzle, a thinking exercise as you go through it. Um, the best thing I could suggest is to buy some cool, some neat designs. There are a ton of freestanding lace and watch them sew out to kind of get an idea of what the base looks like, how they build those designs so that they don't fall apart. And if you kind of look through the patterning and the process that they work through when they're sewing it, it gives you ideas of, all right, now I've got a design, you know, I want to do, I don't know, a scallop with a grid through it. Okay, you've seen how other ones go, so you can take those techniques and apply them to what you're doing. Um, I know when I started digitizing, I, I spent a obscene amount of time just watching things sew out to kind of just understand how embroidery worked and how they p different designers made different decisions. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have some stuff typed in uh, on a YouTube by Debbie. Let's see. I successfully smit, stitched a bear in a small hoop. I've attempted to stitch a German shepherd in a bit, big hoop and it did fine until it got to another color. Then it refuses to pick up the bobbin. I checked the needle orientation. I changed to a new needle. Still no stitch. I changed the Bobbin, magnetic, still no good. Do I have any ideas? It's uh, new to you, Bravo X. So a few things, it might be in the design. Um, if it's bulletproof, what does that mean? So if they've, um, particularly with animals, you'll find some folks tend to just layer upon layer upon layer. So it'll do one color, then another color, and then another color. And by the time you get to some of the detailed shading, there's so many things through there that it's what I, always think of as bulletproof it's hard to stitch through because it's just so th so many things on top of each other so when you're looking at that um ways to fix it one you know use a different design um that's not bulletproof because it's just not a good practice but if what you're trying to do is just get through it and finish that design up um go to, going to a larger needle and changing to a sharp, that can help. So the sharp will help you kind of pierce through that really heavy stuff. The larger needle will help guard the thread as it's going through that kind of roughness, if you will. Increasing your Actifee can help with that a little bit because um, as it gets thicker, you'll end up with, you'll need more thread to be able to stitch through it all. So I would look at that. Um, let's see, he just typed in some more, I think. Oh yeah, uh, okay. So since I'm already thinking about it, when you're using the fast clamps, just I would use hold. Um, 
they're I don't use applique whenever I have a clamp on the machine because it's never fun to knock the um, knock the head off the machine. That's never fun. Uh, <laughs> I like putting them back on, but it's pretty scary if you've not seen it happen before. So anyway, I wouldn't do that. Just use hold and be done with it. So uh, let's see. Back to the German Shepherd. Um, Increasing your active feed, going to a larger needle, a sharp, changing from a ballpoint to a sharp. Um, there are some combination needles that are out there that are pretty good, um, but it's always, you know, when you're dealing with kind of going through aggressive things, going to a sharp helps a lot. Um, trying to think other things to try. Upping your active feed, we talked about. Um, yeah. All right. Well, let's see, what else do we have? We did that. How do you put an outline around elements of an image? Yeah, digitize them in. So let's see. What else do we have? Leather, all right. So if I wanna put a border around something, I'm just gonna do the letter S for the moment. Yeah, actually I'm gonna draw a few quick shapes. So I got a letter, oops, that's a really bad circle. Let's delete that and try that again. Fill, circle, click, click, drag. There we go. All right, so I got two things to put borders around. All right, so a few different ways. If it's lettering, there's a few things you can do. You can go into the properties and you can turn on auto borders. So that's one way to do it. Um, if you don't want to use the auto border, so let's undo that. You can also select it hold your shift key down on the keyboard and click on the single line and that will put a border around whatever shape. So that shift click thing works on any shape. So if I've got a circle here, hold the shift, click on the single line and it'll put a border around that. Okay. This works for things that are digitized um, as wireframe meaning it's an OFM, it was digitized within Design Shop. Now, if you have an expanded file thing, well, then it's a little, um, it's a little more, you gotta think about it a little more. So you can go and either use the generating by, um, basting primer stitch. So mm -hmm. the primer stitch will do a shape. So then you can then take that shape and change it over into a border. So if I take that, instead of using shift, I can hold control, which changes it from one type to another. You notice that it does some weird stuff though, depending on the shape that it's going around. Um, you can also just digitize it, right? So let's say I want to border around my S and it's expanded, so I can't just shift click. Well, I just come into my single line and ideally you would zoom in and not do what I'm about to do, but I'm just going to rough it in. So, and you just left click, right click around whatever shape it is. Um, I'm only going to do one side just to, for, to be pseudo quick. So right click, so your curves. Left click, so your straight lines. I'm going to stop here. Your straight points click, click, and I've got half of an outline. So you can trace your shape on there as well. Okay. So when you have expanded stuff, sometimes it's just a matter of click, 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 click around whatever it is you're trying to outline. Now keep in mind when you're doing things like this, sometimes it's better to make the border wider and put it as sewing beforehand. So you get a nice thin look here without having to do something really tiny that might not register well. So just keep that in mind. There's different techniques to doing borders. Sometimes it's better to sew a wider border first and then do the shape on top um, versus trying to do a really narrow thing on top of the um, previous stitched element. Okay. All right. Let's see. Am I missing any questions? Okay. Back to my PowerPoint. I'm using super trust thread. Uh, you seem to have it sewing pretty decent, but you have breaks around the tie-ins and tie-offs. Is there a particular number that's best? All right, so the tie-in and tie-offs, 
honestly, I have, it's been a really long time since I've used the Super Chest thread and I can't even remember what I used to use for it. Um, the Super Twist thread is, it's got like a plastic kind of wound up with the thread itself, right? So because of that, it, you can get some nuances to it separating up and doing other things. So I would personally go with a larger width on there and as a starting point. So using larger numbers on your width, while it would give you a larger tie that's more visible, it would also be, um, you know, uh, less prone, I would imagine, to breaking at your tie-ins and tie-offs. Now, like I said, it's been so long, I'm trying to remember, but I would start with larger numbers on your widths and try that. And I'll try to get, I didn't get a chance to call the guys beforehand to see what settings they had, but that's where I would start with is using your style one um, tie-ins and tie-outs and then using the width, you know, something bigger than five. I'd probably go six, seven, like you see here as a starting point and try that. Okay. Um, I think the other question was, oh, the I know the Super Twist thread also does recommend a larger needle. Um, I. If memory serves, I think it's actually they actually recommend a 9014. I know on the books that come with them, you'll see, and even on the spools of thread, they'll actually have needles written down that are the recommendation. So I know larger needles are recommended for your um, specialty threads because it's got a wider groove. It helps protect the thread a little bit more. So an 80, that's a good call. Um, slowing it down again is also a really good call, but you may even have um, better luck even going to a 9014. So when working with leather, what do you need to do? So leather's interesting because it's a hide, right? So it doesn't really heal um, as you are stabbing it. So one of the things you have to be careful of is that you're not sewing it so dense that you've created something that's going to break apart. All right. So one of the things that I did early on with leather was I did a border with a really tight satin stitch all the way around and next thing you know the whole thing just fell out of the leather um, so I created a, a patch rather than a piece of leather with a design on it um, so yes reducing your density is important to so you're not sewing it out um, or piercing it so much that it pokes its way out um, so yeah reducing your density is good your leather thickness is the 0.8 to 1. Okay. The needles, uh, 80, 12s are usually pretty good. I'll be honest, I use a 7511 for everything until I run into is issues. Um, that's just, I've got 13 machines, so I, try, I don't like keeping track of where I put needles. So I keep 7511s on everything. And then when I run into issues is when I start changing needles. So like, for instance, if I'm sewing a hat with a 7511 ball, um, ball needle. I know it's going to do better with a sharp, but just being lazy, I'll run it with a 7511 ball. And then if it the, it sews, I smile and move along. If not, I go, eh, I should have put a sharp in there and I change it to a sharp. Okay. So things like that. Um, we did get you some link on you know, how to work with leather. So we've got you some things to read through and um, for considerations there, but really, uh, biggest thing I notice with those is make sure your presser foot's not too low um, because leather does tend to scar, right? If you're hammering it to death with your presser foot, um, you'll get that kind of ghosting along it, which is annoying. Um, on fabric, it's easy to get rid of. You kind of just wet it away. On leather, wetting it, eh, not the best idea. So, um, and really paying attention that you're not sewing it so dense that it pokes out. So there, you can also buy hides that are damaged to test stuff out on. So I know when I was learning leather, I did that. Um, I bought up hides, I think from Tandy. I don't remember, honestly. I've found some on Etsy and different places and just to practice on so I could learn what worked and what didn't. So just a food for thought. Um, I know some folks will say to even go to Goodwill and places like that and look for garments. So if you can find something cheap there to, that you don't mind tearing up, you can try it that way as well. All right.
what else do we have? All right, so those were the questions that were sent in ahead of time. And I'm scrolling through to see if I missed anything. Yeah. Nope, it looks like I got the... Okay, so I got all the ones that were typed in. All right, everyone. What other questions might you have? I'll kind of <laughs> sit here for a minute, see if you guys have anything. If not, we will call it a day and I will be back next week. So let's I'll hold on for just a sec. I know hopefully you guys have some nice plans for the weekend. I'm hoping the weather clears up. Sunday there's a regatta and I was invited to go row on my first regatta. So that's kind of exciting for me. But ah, MK Buddy has a question. All right. So I'm excited to be a novice rower. <laughs> we'll see. This tropical storm might blow it out. On leather, what's um, on leather? What's the max thickness you would want to sew? Um, you know, I've never really thought about it. Uh, I know I've done car mats, which aren't leather, but they're obscenely thick, um, and I haven't had <laughs> any issues with that. Uh, I don't know. Let me ask the guys if they have a suggestion. I know I've done some that's probably an eighth of an inch thick. And while I wouldn't say that was fun, it wasn't horrible either. So uh, I'll ask and try to get back to you on comments. So where was that was on YouTube. So I'll have to go look and get you the response to that, David. All right. Uh, how did you change from advance uh it's the little gear thingy so let's see i gotta find my manual because this computer does not have melco let's see come on um i'm just okay as i Watch it download slowly, I'm sorry. Oh, good, we got you a link instead, that's quicker. There you go, <laughs> rather than me pulling up the manual. So tools, restart in Melco I. So if you're in the advanced, you go from there. So if you're going from uh, simple to advanced, there's this thing down here. If you click on that and then the little gear icon, that's what I was saying, the little gears. And then right here, you'll see there's this Thing here that switches you back and forth so we have a link for you there in the comments that'll take you directly to this article but it's that simple so from the advanced interface this will get you back to the simplified UI and then the these three little buttons here click 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 will get you back to the advanced and that will take you back and forth um, all right so that's quicker than what I was about to do <laughs> all right let's see there was something else typed in uh, any tips for using regular digitized design into a lightweight sketch embroidery design? Um, short of just digitizing it how you want it to look, not really. Uh, because why I say that, a right, a stuff that's digitized to be just a fully sewn, like a complex fill tatami type stitch, it, changing that over to kind of a light sketch work is just redoing the design entirely, right? Because there's different techniques you want to apply to that you're not just going to decrease the density and say go because there's underlay on there there's it might not have the stitches in the direction you want um, you may want to have shading done by having a few different colors on top of each other so personally if I'm trying to get a sketch look I digitize it as a sketch look if I'm trying to get a fully filled design I digitize it that way so I don't know of any way to just say poof make it switch from one to the other because it's different te digitizing techniques you're going to use running stitches and other things like that it's just a completely different art book artwork uh oh debbie did ask am i aware of any techs in the new york area um there was some up there it let's see melco dash service so if you go here i don't even I don't know who's up there anymore. So right here you have the certified technicians and 
there, click on a bubble and you find your tech. So that'll get you the different techs you can find. We'll get you that link up there as well. All right, let's see. I don't see any other questions. All right, y'all. Oh, something else. And we did get you a link to the text. All right, awesome. Well, you guys have a fantastic weekend. I'm hoping weather clears so I can go have some fun. Um, if not, we will be back next week to see what questions you have. So you can email applications at mailco.com. You can type them in on the little video. You know, I'll post in the different groups this little cover sheet asking for questions. So, um, yeah. We'll let us know what you want to talk about and we'll try to work. I hope these are helpful for you. I enjoy doing them. Sorry I missed last week. It was bad. Uh, my whole house ended up with the flu. So I don't recommend that. So, yeah. <laughs> you guys have a fantastic weekend and I will talk to you guys next week. Bye, everybody.